Hello and welcome to Sound Strategic. I'm James Crabtree, Executive Director of the IISS Asia office in Singapore and today's guest host for the podcast where we're going to be talking about the vexed issue of Taiwan in the aftermath of the visit of Nancy Pelosi and the subsequent military exercises conducted by the People's Republic of China. Taiwan has been at the forefront of Asian and world geopolitical concern. And I'm joined by three of my colleagues to look through what happened, where this might go, and what it means for relations between the United States and China. Joining me today are Mayor Noens, the IISS Senior Fellow for Chinese Defense Policy and Military Modernization, Franz Stefan Gaddy, Senior Fellow for Cyber, Space, and Future Conflict, and Henry Boyd, Research Fellow for Defense and Military Analysis. So let me start with you, Mayor. You've just come back from Taiwan, and maybe during the podcast you can tell us a little bit about what you learned there, but maybe set the scene for our listeners. We had the Pelosi visit and the subsequent military exercises. Have we, in a sense, reached a, a new normal on cross-strait relations? Are things going to continue to be this bad in future? There's a yes and a no answer to this question. I think there's a yes answer in the sense that Beijing willing to push the boundaries on military activity around the island in ways that we hadn't seen in the past. So a high tempo of exercises in terms of um, naval and air exercises around Taiwan, pushing the boundaries further into Taiwan's air defense identification zone, but also, of course, very importantly, crossing what is known as the median line of the Taiwan Strait. And I think it's really important to note that in the past, although Beijing has officially stated that it doesn't believe a median line in the Taiwan Strait exists, it never really crossed those in uh, the exercises that it conducted around Taiwan. That's changed since Pelosi's uh, visit. So we now see nearly daily or um, every other day exercises, and many of those cross uh, this sensitive median line, uh, which is considered to be more provocative uh, in terms of the signal it sends to Taiwan, but also allies and partners. So I'd say yes, in terms of the military new normal, but in terms of the political calculations and the economic calculations around this new normal, I'm not so sure. At the end of the day, I think we're still looking at a Beijing that has the same political and economic calculations with regards to a Taiwan contingency or forced unification as President Xi has laid out on the table as an option if peaceful reunification doesn't exist. So in that sense, concern around what the political and economic consequences of such an action might be for the CCP and for the Chinese economy should a potential attack on Taiwan fail to deliver uh, reunification, uh, I think those are still very much the same. Henry, let me turn to you. You you sit within our defense and military analysis program at the IISS and watch very carefully the Chinese military. What did we learn from the military exercises which followed Speaker Pelosi's visit? It's an interesting question, generally, what we expected to learn from them. We're never going to be a kind of a very clear blueprint of look at how we would intend to either invade Taiwan, blockade Taiwan, or conduct a full-scale firepower operation against them. The assets used were relatively well known, but the older, more trusted parts of the PLA infantry were on some of their new capabilities, and it was far more intended to be a, a kind of a message of intent than anything else. I think as Meyer has touched upon, you do begin to see both with the exercise themselves, but with the subsequent continuation of PLA activity, a slight change in flavour, a slightly more assertive stance by the PLA in regards to Taiwan, um, and a, a switch from their previous operations, which had kind of dallied in the sort of southwestern corner of Taiwan's ADIS to being a much clearer, more persistent crossing of the median line. There are kind of two things that strike me clearly looking at the one is so the scale of this exercise is not something you throw together at the spur of the moment this is clearly not simply a an improvised response to Pelosi's visit per se that one the PLA has been conducting larger large-scale multi-theater command joint service exercises over the last few years our insight into public information about this exercise has become less frequent and the PLA as Myers noted in previous writing that they've become slightly less transparent on that aspect but it's worth 
thinking about was this essentially a demonstration that was always intended to be conducted at some point this year maybe looking ahead to Taiwan's National Day and something that was merely brought forward or scaled up a little bit in response to Pelosi's visit also I think it's worth considering how the PLA's pattern of activity towards Taiwan fits into their wider pattern of activity both in the region extra regionally even before Pelosi's visit US officials US observers the PLA were discussing that the, the, the basically kind of outlining the fact that they thought the PLA had consciously decided to take a more assertive aggressive policy in their their dealings with other countries that that maybe that Beijing had after some consideration in previous years had taken a conscious decision to become more assertive and had increased the profile of the PLA within those activities, that this greater assertiveness was necessary to convey a message that they felt wasn't getting through otherwise, and that to that extent is the PLA's actions towards Taiwan, both immediately after Pelosi's visit and subsequently, is that abnormal? Does that actually fit into a wider pattern of PLA activity elsewhere, if not directly, at least in kind of this broad sense we've seen highly sort of public senses of, of PLA intercept capability with the Australians, an instance there. There are probably more activity of, uh, in a similar vein that doesn't go as closely reported that is, isn't in the public domain. That's something I think is worth looking into is is uh, to what extent is their action towards Taiwan part of a wider policy from Beijing or part of a specific Taiwan-related issue? Franz, let me turn to, to you building on what Henry's just said. You're putting the finishing touches to a double I double S book at the moment about future war fighting in Asia in the coming years. Did anything strike you about the Chinese military exercises before we go on to, to talk about, in a sense, what we've learned geopolitically from this moment, but on the military side? Thank you, James. Well, as uh, Henry pointed out, I do think that this has been part of the PLA's uh, regular summer exercise season. So I think perhaps it was scaled up as a result of the Pelosi visit or it was, you know, the date was slightly changed. But such big military exercises require a lot of planning and preparation. So this was definitely not an ad hoc event just in response to Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. What struck me were essentially to things. First of all, I think one could observe a concerted effort by the People's Liberation Army to improve the realism of its training exercises. I think that could be observed to a certain degree. And the second aspect, also briefly touched upon by Henry, is uh, this idea of jointness or joint training. That is, uh, this exercise involved really all the uh, service branches of the People's Liberation Army, that is, the Army itself, the People's Liberation Army Air Force, People's Liberation Army Navy, People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force and Rocket Forces and so forth. And I think in my field, particularly the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force, which is responsible for cyber operations, larger scale electronic warfare and so forth. This is something that I wanted to pay particular attention to. And I think this idea of integrating different emerging technological capabilities for a potential Taiwan contingency is something that we need to watch out in future exercises. And of course, this is also the part of an exercise that it's most difficult to observe. And there have been some hints that um, this exercise act that there was actually extensive electronic warfare and an extensive electronic warfare component, also a cyber element to it, and that the disruption of um, so-called C4 ISR networks was also simulated. This, I think, is is just also important to, to understand because any future conflict in, um, over Taiwan involving the PLA and potentially the United States will be operating in a fairly contested operational environment. Cyber will play a big a part of that. Electronic warfare is going to be important. That, to me, was perhaps the most uh, interesting part from my subfield here. Mayor, let me bring it back to you to take it up a level from the purely military. It would be useful to hear, I think, what you feel both on the Taiwanese side and on the Chinese side has been achieved or taken away from these exercises. So first, let's deal with Taiwan. You were just there. What did you learn on your trip to Taipei? And, and what do you think this series of events, what impression has this left on Taiwan's political leadership? It's put Taiwan's political leadership in a bit of a bind, to be honest. On the one hand, there's obviously a great sense of urgency around the fact that the Taiwanese government needs to both prepare for a potential contingency uh, and prepare the Taiwanese general audience or general public uh, for a potential contingency in the future, whilst not alarming them and creating panic. 
that's a very difficult balance to strike um, from their perspective. So far for the last few decades, I think the general sense when Taiwan has been that a war across the strait is extremely unlikely and the PLA uh, and Chinese leadership would never uh, consider this, that it's just an empty threat. I think looking at Ukraine, that's changed a little bit in terms of public sentiment in Taiwan. And so for the government now, uh, what we saw during this series of exercises following Pelosi's visit was almost testing that balance in, in practice. Uh, in particular, there was an incident in which the government chose not to disclose that the PLA had fired missiles over Taiwan, which landed in the Sea of Japan, which ultimately left the uh, Taiwanese audience to learn about this incident from uh, Japanese news media, which of course is followed quite closely in Taiwan. And so they think these are all lessons that are being absorbed at the moment. On the other hand, there's also lessons being absorbed about the need to perhaps reform the Taiwanese uh, conscription system and also uh, the reserve system to make these more effective uh, at the end of the day. And a lot needs to happen in that respect in order to make general uh, civil defense even possible. Lastly, of course, there's uh, incredible discussions happening in Taiwan around questions of disinformation and how to fight and counter disinformation in the event of a crisis or, or a conflict. We saw that there were hacking attempts on Taiwanese government websites. On the other hand, we also saw, for example, certain electronic billboards being hacked in Taiwan, which uh, sent messages from, we presume, Chinese hackers to spread disinformation across the general population. So whilst Taiwan is, of course, big been the recipient of disinformation attacks in the past, that again signals the need to further its efforts to actually put in practice a counter and disinformation efforts. Now, all three of you actually on the podcast today were in Taipei, but Maya, since you're, you have the microphone, not very many people have been to Taipei in the last few years because it's been locked up because of COVID regulations. It's still not easy to get in there and you guys all had to do your period of quarantine. But uh, tell our listeners, what was it like? I mean, what, what was the mood as you were talking to people in the government and in the think tank community? What did you discover about the way that people there are thinking about this? From what I discovered, I don't think there's any sense that a conflict and forced reunification is going to happen imminently. In the general public as well, when you speak to everyday Taiwanese, and I have many friends in Taiwan still, there is a general sense that there's still time. War is not imminent. On the other hand, there is the sense um, of urgency, I think, within the government, as I said before, to actually prepare better. There's also, of course, a, a discussion happening within the government about how to best coordinate and collaborate and work together with like-minded friends and partners of Taiwan uh, in addition to the United States. So there is a lot of movement, I think, within the government, but there's not a huge sense of panic, I think, just yet, which really struck me. If you look at, for example, uh, newspapers in Europe covering the post-Pelosi exercises, you would almost get the sense that forced reunification and a conflict across the Taiwan Strait was going to happen next week, if not tomorrow. That sense is very, very different in Taipei. Henry, when you were there as well, did you pick up anything that struck you about the conversations that, that you had on the military side? No, I think I'd echo some of Maya's question. I, a lot of a lot of the kind of the points of emphasis that your Taiwanese discuss on the military side tend to emphasize the medium to longer term development of capability designs, and again, emphasize that sense of you're not expecting to deal with an immediate crisis. COVID still appears to loom larger in terms of officials' crisis concerns than military action with China does, albeit Ukraine may have thrown that into a slightly sharper relief, but you don't get the sense there that there's the next two or three years of vital. I know there's the, the ongoing 2027 debate about what the evidential basis behind some claims on that score are and the differences between capability and intent. Whilst you do see elected officials from academia and from government civil service, a greater emphasis on the need to improve Taiwan's military capability. And I think that sort of go, that's been a priority for the side administration. This sense of post-Ukraine imminence of uh, 
that the Taiwan Strait is, is the next big crisis is, is about to happen on our doorstep is perhaps this is about as much wishful thinking, but maybe maybe it's more a, re- a reflection of the Western unfamiliarity with the issue and suddenly rushing into an area of concern as opposed to kind of the Taiwanese living through this sort of week by week and try, taking the te- having maybe a sort of a much closer familiarity with the cross-strait relationship and with the nuances of Beijing's own thinking on this issue and, and making judgments about imminence or lack of imminence about threat perceptions on that basis. May I mentioned Ukraine, and I wanted to move on to Ukraine in just a second. But, but before we do that, before we move off the current moment, Franz, you and Maya recently co-wrote a report about Europe and its response to a potential Taiwan crisis. Now, I don't know if you were following closely how any of the European countries reacted to this particular moment of crisis, but I wondered if you might give us a flavor of your analysis of the way in European capitals that a worsening of the Taiwan situation, I mean, how's that being considered? What sort of options do European countries, if any, have to play a part in this? Generally speaking, I think there's an increased sense of awareness over a potential future military crisis over Taiwan. Most of the governments have issued regular uh, statements pertaining to the Chinese military exercises, emphasizing that the status quo should not be changed by force. The European parliament uh, condemned the military exercise. If I remember, um, the German government also used a little bit of stronger wording um, in their statement condemning the military exercises. What I've noticed over the summer was that this visit by Pelosi to Taiwan has perhaps helped raise awareness about this issue among European government circles. That to me is definitely something that I haven't seen in the years before. That doesn't really mean that they have a coherent strategy how to deal with any of this, but it definitely has has raised awareness. And um, just to pick up on what Maya and Henry said before, what struck me visiting the country was that to me it seemed that the war in Ukraine actually raised awareness that this is something that potentially could happen actually in Taiwan as well, in a way. It's sort of the sense of what Lenin, I think, or was it Trotsky said, you know, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you to a certain degree. I've noticed that going to a bookstore, for example, in Taipei, where the books that were most prominently featured there were actually about the war in Ukraine. And then the, the other book that was fairly prominently featured was about an asymmetric defense strategy for Taiwan by a fairly prominent Taiwanese military thinker. So I do think that there's awareness at least as well, um, perhaps, you know, in smaller circles and in the elite that this war is indeed something that we need to worry about in Taiwan as well now. An elegant segue, Franz. Thank you very much. That brings us nicely on to the topic of Ukraine, which I wanted to move us on to. Maya, lessons from Ukraine for Taiwan. I mean, we've since the February invasion, We at the IISS, in common with many people who watch conflict and international affairs, have been poring over what's been happening in Ukraine, either from your more recent visit or in general. What do we take away from this conflict? How is it changing the calculations on either side, on Beijing's side or on Taipei's side? I'll touch on the poll mill issues and leave the others for my uh, distinguished colleagues. Let's say for the PLA first. It's hard to know for certain, but I think there's two things I take away. First of all, loyalty of the PLA to the party is going to be emphasized more than ever moving forward. It was already a key cornerstone of Xi's control over the PLA. As, of course, our listeners will know, the PLA is the party's army, not the country's army. The question of whether or not that loyalty is actually firm and concrete and unwavering within the PLA in the event of a conflict is something that's going to be considered quite deeply, um, having looked at how Russian forces have responded or not in Ukraine. And of course, we just saw in the last couple of days yet another declaration from the PLA as to how loyal they are to the party. And of course, President Xi is chairman of uh, the Central Military Commission. The second thing that I take away from that is the importance from the PLA's perspective of information gathering and information dominance in the event of a conflict. So in terms of information gathering, the question that I think the PLA might be asking themselves is, is our understanding of Taiwan as good as the Russians thought their understanding of Ukraine was? We won't know the answer to that question, and we don't know whether for sure they're asking that question. Having looked at some of the assumptions perhaps that were made in Russia with regards to how easy a conflict on Ukraine might be, that might be another question related to how the PLA views Taiwan. 
I'd certainly say that that might also be the case, considering that the CCP is perhaps losing uh, space within Taiwan's political landscape in terms of influence or relations with Taiwanese domestic political parties. The KMT does not look like it's going to be in a good position to win presidential elections in 2024. It looks like it might make some ground in terms of uh, local elections that are coming up later this year. By and large, the Kuomintang, the KMT party, uh, which is the most pro-mainland party in Taiwan, is not gaining the levels of popularity that it had prior to uh, 2016. Second of all, in terms of information dominance, again, I think that is a really important lesson for the PLA moving forward. The ability to quickly deny Taiwan uh, the ability to reach out, control the narrative of a conflict, and thereby also gain potentially support internationally in the event of a contingency is something that the PLA will be looking for. And on Taiwan's perspective, I think there's a couple of lessons here as well that touch on the issues that I just mentioned in terms of underestimating or overestimating the PLA, but also in terms of that civilian response when it comes to Taiwan. What happens in the event of a conflict, an armed contingency that is either foreseen or not foreseen? How is the Taiwanese public going to respond? Is the Taiwanese public sufficiently trained and capable to actually provide some level of resistance and contribute to this total defense concept and uh, civilian defense that uh, the Taiwanese foresee as being incredibly important in the event of a conflict. For the Taiwanese, I think lastly, we're going to have to remember that this conflict is going to look very different from Ukraine. It's highly unlikely to be the refugee exodus that we see. So really, what we have in Taiwan at the moment, uh, or at the time of a conflict, is what Taiwan is going to be fighting with uh, and for. Henry, let me in a sense ask the same question to you, but on the military side. You've been watching Ukraine in great detail. What do you take out of that conflict that has relevance for a potential future conflict between China and Taiwan or China and the United States over Taiwan? I think firstly, it's probably important to caveat that kind of military lessons to be taken away, that what the PLA will actually take away versus what they could take away is, is as much a function of how the bureaucracy sort of inculcates lessons and distributes them as anything else. I think there are some key things that they'll look at. I think the most important, which is the PLA has has very strongly emphasised the importance of cognitive superiority, a cognitive advantage, the seizure and maintenance of the initiative during operations as a key element of success. I suspect they'll look at Russia's operations in Ukraine as an example of the failure of that. Russia's attempt to decapitate the Ukrainian government early on by capturing or killing President Zelensky and his closest advisers will seem to be a key contributor to Ukraine's ability to resist. And I think the PLA will will want to examine how successful Ukrainians were at being able to out-adapt the Russians both early on in the conflict and throughout that area. The PLA will look at the Russians and think they were never able to achieve the cognitive advantage that we see as crucial. That's a key part of contributing to their defeat. On the one hand, that will, re- I think, probably re-emphasize PLA assumptions about the importance of, the co- of cognitive advantage to their operations, but may also emphasize the, the challenges of getting it wrong and the degree of caution in terms of how that is implemented. I think a similar aspect probably applies to um, Russia's use of air power and long-range firepower, sort of a key part of the PLA's enabling cap- capacity in an operation against Taiwan, their ability to write down both the Taiwanese own defensive capabilities, but also to deter or hold off um, reinforcement of Taiwan from uh, the United States or other other extra-regional allies. Um, again, I suspect it'll be as much an emphasis on Russia's failure there will emphasize its importance to the PLA. They will draw the lesson if Russia had a stronger capability in that area, they would have been more likely more successful. But also the challenges of that essentially this is this is not e- an easy capacity to bring up and simply having technological capacity in that area does not necessarily translate to operational capability so two things i think that will not necessarily change the pla's mind about what they think is important for, for military operations against taiwan but may emphasize a greater sense of the importance of capability development of the full integration of training and equipment and operational concepts um, in terms of the, the, the way mission command is integrated into this capacity, the ability to deliver adaptability, to deliver effective cognitive advantage on the battlefield, it may also emphasize a longer term PLA desire for greater integration of artificial intelligence into their capacity in the longer term to try and 
counter some perceived disadvantages in terms of low-level mission command amongst junior officers. All that being said, that kind of emphasizes against the way in which the PLA bureaucracy is capable of delivering some of those actions. Russia probably pre-Ukraine thought they themselves had had identified these 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 important lessons and adapted to be able to deliver that on the battlefield. Um, as we've seen over the last six or seven months, they have become unstuck in a number of ways on that. That balance between reinforcing existing lessons, that kind of playing into an existing narrative and viewing lessons through a existing sort of structure of concepts and operational doctrine, but also that interplay between when do you think we're ready to do this? How do you judge kind of capacity in this area? How well is information flowing from military units up the chain of command to, to ultimate political decision makers in the CMC. Is that flow happening relatively efficiently and are the lessons being transferred unrestrictedly or is there a level where the information reaching the top echelons of PLA and PRC decision making is somehow blurred, distorted or kind of misconstrued? Fran, same question to you. You have, for the IISS, been extremely active on Twitter updating all of us on the the latest comings and goings in the Ukraine conflict, in particular with your future conflict goggles on, what have we learned from Ukraine that's relevant for a future cross-strait crisis? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to understand the difference between the war in Ukraine and the potential future conflict over Taiwan. In terms of complexity of operations, it's sort of comparing a soapbox derby to a Formula One race to a certain degree. Right? Taiwan is just would be an immensely more complex operation that the PLA would conduct at all levels and across all domains. And that, I think, is something to keep in mind. And I think to a certain degree, this is also serving as a deterrent, I think, to the PLA leadership, perhaps, and the political leadership, because at some point there has to be this realization that an amphibious assault operation or even a joint strike fire campaign against Taiwan is going to be much more demanding or demanding on the PLA than land invasion of a neighboring state, so to speak, without a waterway in between that needs to be crossed. I think that alone, I think, limits also what lessons we can take from this conflict and apply to Taiwan. One of the main lessons when it comes to the cyber and space domains of the conflict in Ukraine is really the importance of the space domain, particularly for command and control purposes. I think the cyber story of the war in Ukraine still needs to be written, and there are definitely some lessons that can be taken from that domain and applied to Taiwan. At the beginning of the conflict, there's more and more evidence that the Russians conducted offensive cyber operations against Ukrainian uh, command and control networks and were quite successful with taking them down. And I think that's something that obviously would happen on a similar level um, when it comes to a, a war um, over Taiwan. And here, I think, you know, the importance of, of the space domain, which is really fairly interconnected with the cyber domain, becomes also critical here, particularly when we look at what future technological capabilities we need to look at in order to prop up deterrence in the Taiwan Strait. And I think the workshop that Maya Henry and I um, held in Singapore a couple of days ago, one piece that I thought was particularly interesting is the quantum technology aspect of future emerging technological capabilities, particularly quantum sensing. And quantum sensing will be potentially fairly important in a future conflict because it reduces the dependency on space both the United States and Taiwan, but also China would be enormously dependent on space, uh, that is satellites for um, their precision guided weapons, also for navigation and other fairly important military tasks. If we can reduce the dependency on space, I think that's something that all sides will want to pay close attention to in a potential future conflict. And I think this to me paired also with what Henry said about, you know, the use of artificial intelligence and how this can be integrated in targeting cycles, whether that's of kinetic or non-kinetic nature, is going to be really, really critical when it comes to trying to prop up deterrence, at least, you know, field new capabilities over the next 10 to 20 years by the PLA or the United States or Taiwan or anyone else who's going to be involved in conflict over Taiwan in the future. So final question to you, Mayor. Let's look forward a little bit. It's going to be a a momentous month in October for China watchers as we head to the 20th Party Congress. And then we will wait to see not just the membership of the new standing committee and indeed its leader, but also what kind of Chinese leadership we will get in the aftermath of, of this moment in the political calendar. So 
How are you watching that? And to the extent that anybody knows what's going to happen, what are you expecting? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. As we've seen in the last week, there have been some wild rumors circulating the media about whether or not a coup was taking place in China and whether or not Xi Jinping was in lockdown under house arrest, uh, which all uh, have turned out to be untrue. So I think we're really hitting peak speculation time when it comes to China watching. That being said, there are some key members of the Central Military Commission that are of retirement age. So what I'll be watching for is uh, whether or not we'll see significant changes within the Central Military Commission. If we do see changes within the Central Military Commission, who replaces the trusted allies that she has put in place over the last few years will be, what services they come from, also what experience they have and what that might tell us about how PLA uh, modernization and reform will continue to evolve over the next five years uh, in Xi's third term. In terms of what type of actor China will be, in the next five years following the 20th Party Congress. I actually think despite some uh, serious policy miscalculations over the last couple of years, notably during COVID and, and following that with regards to China's foreign relations, particularly Europe and, and the West, I actually think that when it comes to the Taiwan Strait, what we've seen in terms of policy decision making has been relatively cautious. And I think that goes back to our assessment of the fact that the PLA still has quite a ways to go with regards to achieving the modernization it seeks to achieve by 2035. France mentioned jointness. That's something that the PLA is still incredibly behind on from what we can see, although, of course, it has made progress in the last few years. So these are not easy changes to make. These are not easy reforms to achieve. And I think at the end of the day, that caution will continue whilst the PLA remains unready to undertake as complex a task as a, a potential uh, forced reunification of Taiwan might be. However, we also need to look at the domestic context within China. There's problems at the moment, to say the least, with regards to economic growth, issues around mortgages, uh, issues around the dynamic zero COVID policy and what that's doing to the economy. So whether all of those real important issues are going to be addressed in the next few months uh, or year following the 20th Party Congress is something that's going to, I think, determine what type of actor we see China able to be moving forward as well. And last but not least, of course, when it comes to the CCP's Taiwan policy, a, a white paper was published in the last few months that spelled out the outlook that the CCP has with regards to Taiwan. I don't think that's going to change uh, dramatically from that either. It's going to be an interesting month, and I have a sneaking suspicion that we may be back on some strategic talking about China before too long. Thank you very much to my colleagues, Mayor Owens, Fran Stefan Gaddy, and Henry Boyd. Thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. For more in depth analysis, visit the IISS website, follow us on Twitter, and even on LinkedIn. You can find more information in the show notes. Please do follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic wherever you happen to listen to your favorite podcasts and to keep up to date with the latest episodes. Thank you very much, and see you next time.